Where is God? Uh, it's a question asked by lots of people for a variety of reasons throughout the whole of human history. Maybe you found yourself asking that very question. In a moment of doubt or in a difficult period in your life, uh, we often ask, where is God? Where's God when I need him? Where's God when I need something fixed? Where's God when I need someone fixed? Where's God when there's an international crisis or a huge moment in human history? Um, you may have heard the famous quote, God is in the detail. Um, I thought it was attributed to Albert Einstein, the world famous Nobel Prize winning physicist. But as I did some research for this sermon, I found out Einstein didn't say it at all. It was this random architect called Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, who I've never heard of. Um, and I preached this at the 8am a couple of hours ago and a guy in the audience came up to me afterwards. He goes, I'm an architect, that guy's my hero. I was like, okay, <laughs> fair enough, there you go. All good. Um, so as I Googled for this quote by Einstein, I actually came across another quote by Einstein, which I think is perhaps even more helpful and more thought provoking as we work our way through today's passage. Einstein apparently said, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. Coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous and God is in the detail. And I want you to keep both of these quotes in mind as we work through today's passage. So let's start with a quick recap. We're dealing with a, a chunk of narrative here in Esther um, and let's see where we're at with the story so far. Scott started off in week one. Um, he mentioned that the book's author is unknown. We're set in Susa, which is the capital of ancient Persia, and it's around 483 BC when King Xerxes is on the throne. Xerxes' wife Vashti is asked by Xerxes to parade around at a banquet to display her beauty, to show her off to, to all of his drinking mates. She refuses and she is sacked as queen then and there. A beauty contest is held to find a replacement and a Jew who's living in exile, Esther, wins and becomes queen. And we also heard about this plot to kill King Xerxes being uncovered by Mordecai. Mordecai is like Esther's adoptive father. In week two, Josh picked up the story where Scott left off. Haman, who's Xerxes' sort of right-hand man, devises this plot to wipe the Jews from the face of the earth. And Mordecai and Esther are left to work out how to save their people. Mordecai says to Esther that relief and deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place, but he asks her, who knows but that you have come to a royal position for such a time as this? Esther agrees to help and asks for the Jews to fast for her, and that's where we're up to in the story. Also, by my count, there have been at least six major coincidences in the story so far, and I've put this list together. I've called it the coincidence counter. Um, I know technically they're not all coincidences. Some of them are just extraordinary events or extraordinary decisions, but I'm using that as a shortcut phrase, the coincidence counter. And it would take too long to go through all of them, but let's just pick a couple. Number two, Queen Vashti. What if Queen Vashti decides she does want to parade around in front of Xerxes and his drunken mates? Well, Esther never becomes queen. God's people are in big trouble. Number five, if Mordecai never overhears the plot, well, he never gets honoured by Xerxes. Haman remains the wicked right-hand man. And again, God's people are in real jeopardy. So you can see that on any one of these, if things went on a different path, God's people are even in even more trouble than what they apparently appear to be right now. So these are really critical as we go through. And Esther is a bit of an odd book in the Bible. Why? Well, as Scott and Josh have mentioned over the last few weeks, God isn't even mentioned in the whole book and there's no direct reference to prayer. What can we learn from a book that God is apparently absent from? Is it just a story about some random people and the banquets they hold and the wine they drink? Perhaps to the atheist, the person who doesn't believe in God, that's exactly what it is. It's just an interesting series of events that just happen to take place in a particular order and, and nothing more. Well, that's the genius of the book of Esther. God is everywhere. you just got to search a little. All right, let's take a bit more of a detailed look at this week's passage. Chapters 5 to 7 contain a fair bit of narrative and a massive reversal. And I want you to see, realistically, two things as we go through it. First, 
the events descend down to a low point and then they start ascending and getting better for our heroes. And second, we'll continue the coincidence count. We'll see how many we get to. Um, I'm going to break it up chapter by chapter and we're going to go pretty quickly, so follow along in the handout if you can. We're at point one on the handout. Our passage opens with Esther going to meet King Xerxes. This is actually a really, really big deal. Queen Esther was risking her life just by approaching the king to make a request. You might recall back in chapter four that no one, not even the queen, could approach the king without being summoned. You needed an invitation to meet with the king. The punishment was automatic death. You just rock up to, to meet with King Xerxes, it's automatic death, unless King Xerxes extends his scepter and spares your life. And you'll see in the little picture up there, King Xerxes is doing just that. And if you think it's an idle threat, you think, oh, this stuff doesn't happen. Consider what happened to Queen Vashti when she disobeyed the king's orders. Gone, instantly gone as queen. Esther approaching the king is a big deal. So what happens? Xerxes doesn't kill Esther. Instead, he asks her what her request is and offers her up to half of his kingdom, half the kingdom then and there. Most of us would probably take that and run. I probably would. Esther says she wants to host a banquet for Xerxes and Haman, and she does. And at that banquet, when again she's offered half the kingdom, she says, wait for it, can we all come back here again tomorrow night so that I can answer your question at a second banquet. This is weird. This is really, really weird, except once we see what happens between the first banquet and the second banquet. Let's call this strange coincidence number eight, also known as the double dinner delay. Next, we get through verses uh, eight through 14. Uh, I've summarised this section by calling it Bye Bye Mordecai. Um, <laughs> Haman goes about his business happy the next day until he sees Mordecai. And Mordecai, again, just refuses to honour Haman, refuses to bow down. Read with me verse 9. He neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, and he, Haman, was filled with rage against Mordecai. Haman goes back to his friends and his wife, Zeresh, and he boasts to them about his wealth, his sons, his promotion above all these other officials in the court in the king's palace, his invitation to dinner with Xerxes and Esther, and he says none of it, none of it gives him any satisfaction so long as Mordecai is alive. He hates Mordecai. That's how angry he is. And they tell him to prepare a gallows for Mordecai. Things are getting worse for God's people and for Mordecai in particular. Will it be bye-bye Mordecai? Um, so that brings us to point two on the handout and the pivotal chapter six, which I've called Sleepless in Susa. Uh, King Xerxes can't sleep, so he asks for the chronicles, that's the record of all of his achievements, to be read to him. So that is, they keep this record in the king's palace of all the countries they've invaded, all the wealth they've carried off back to Susa, all of the king's achievements. There's a record of it called the chronicles. Um, surely that would put anyone to sleep, right? Um, it just so happens that the particular section that gets read that night is where it's recorded that Mordecai uncovered the plot against Xerxes. What are the chances of that? King Xerxes asks, well, what's been done to thank and honour Mordecai? The answer? Nothing. Nothing. No one's done anything. Got to fix that. So he asks, who's in the court? Guess who just happens to be there? Haman. What a coincidence, another one. He asks Haman, verse 6, sorry, wrong slide, uh, what should be done for the man the king delights to honour? Haman, thinking he's talking about him, dreams up the best honour he can imagine, a royal robe, royal horses, a procession through the streets, everything you could possibly want. Haman says, yep, this is all coming to me, so I'm going to make this as lavish as I possibly can. And it turns out King Xerxes thinks, yeah, this is a great idea for Mordecai, to honour Mordecai. And the tables are turned. This is the big turning point in the book of Esther. Things have gotten worse to this point and now they start to get better. Haman has to lead the horse that Mordecai, his mortal enemy, rides through the streets in a procession. 
He goes home to his wife and to his entourage and they can see the writing on the wall. They tell him in verse 13, this is the one on the screen, since Mordecai, before whom your downfall has started, is of Jewish origin, you cannot stand against him. You will surely come to ruin. Haman's family and his advisors have seen God at work, or at least something is up, and that whatever Haman does, he cannot win. Okay, so we move to part three, chapter seven, final part of today's passage. For those of you wondering what happened to the second dinner that Esther was planning to hold, here it is. Esther hosts King Xerxes and Haman for dinner, and she's asked again by Xerxes, what's your request? I'll give you up to half the kingdom. Again, half the kingdom is on offer. Esther asks for something entirely different. She reveals herself as Jewish and she asks for her people to be spared. She identifies Haman as the designer of this awful genocidal plan and Haman's fate is sealed. The king leaves in a rage and then returns to the banquet hall just as Haman is attempting to molest Queen Esther and Xerxes orders his immediate death. Haman ends up being hanged on the very gallows he'd built for Mordecai and is yet in yet another ironic twist. Bye-bye, Haman. And let's not forget the incredible timing of this second dinner. Esther gets to make this request after the king's change of heart towards Mordecai and the Jews. If this had been requested at the first dinner, again, who knows what the response would have been. And where are we up to on the coincidence counter? This will go... There we go. Number 11 on the coincidence counter. Um, And you'll see I've sort of highlighted in yellow, there's a number of things that just happen somehow in the nick of time. This unusually happens. There's so many twists and turns in this. It just gets crazy. So where do we leave the story? We leave the story with the threat to the Jews still hanging over their heads. Sure, Haman's gone. But the order from King Xerxes to eliminate the Jews still stands. And let's not, let's not forget, those orders from the king can't be reversed. They have to go miles out to all over the Persian Empire. They can't get reversed. Once an order goes out, that's it. It's done. What's going to happen to God's people? Are they going to avoid being wiped out? What's going to happen to Mordecai? What's going to happen to Esther? Well, you're just going to have to come back next week with Dr. Peter Ryan, who will finish off our series in Esther. So we've seen in the Bible passage today an extraordinary number of coincidences, and I was thinking about how to illustrate them, and I remembered a birthday I had many years ago. My wife, Tash, said, you know, let's go to dinner for your birthday, and so she had to come for somewhere else. I was coming from elsewhere, and we agreed to meet at this, this restaurant bar place. And I get to the restaurant and I see someone I know from university at the bar and I'm like, oh, g'day, Dave, how are you going? And I'm thinking, well, that's a coincidence. You know, Tash and I are here for, for dinner and so is Dave. You know, that's interesting. As I'm chatting to Dave at the bar, out of the corner of my eye, I see a guy I play soccer with <laughs> coming out of the bathroom. And I'm like, what, what's Gilly doing coming out of the bathroom at the same restaurant that Dave's at where Tash and I are, whatever, whatever. And then I sort of took another step and I saw a guy I worked with and I'm like, what the, the... And then I took two more steps and there's 25 people there and Tash had organised a surprise birthday party for me. So there you go. The weight of too many coincidences came crashing in all at once and all of a sudden it became completely obvious that this wasn't just a series of coincidences. One person that I knew, maybe. Two people I knew, well, astonishing but not impossible. Three, four, five, twenty... Something else must be going on. The coincidences can no longer be coincidental. The weight of too many coincidences just came crashing down in a split second. Obviously, obviously, someone had organised all of these people to be here at the same time. Thank you, Tash. And this is a big part of the message of Esther, and it's the genius of Esther. There are way too many coincidences and crazy events for it to just be random. It compels us to look for another explanation. One commentator put it this way, and I really like this. I think it really sums it up well. The author is suggesting that beneath the surface of even seemingly insignificant human decisions and events, 
and unseen and uncontrollable power is at work that can be neither explained nor thwarted. It is proper to construe that unseen power as God. You'll recall that uh, Einstein apparently said coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. With all due respect to Einstein, and I failed Year 11 physics, so I have a lot of respect for Einstein. With all due respect to Einstein, I think the phrase should have been coincidence is God's way of revealing himself. Or perhaps, as we work through Esther, a series of coincidences is God's way of revealing himself. If the 11 coincidences in the story so far don't convince you that something more is going on, that God is at work, then I'm going to organise your next birthday party. How do we apply the message of Esther? We're up to the application section on the handout. Well, I think there are two traps uh, in, in looking at Esther. Um, and by avoiding both of them, we'll find a helpful way to see God appropriately in our lives. The first trap is the person that sees God in absolutely everything. And you might have come across people who, who sort of go, oh, you just wouldn't believe it. This morning I woke up and... Uh, God was just at work as I tipped the cornflakes out of the packet into the bowl. The way the flakes fell was just God at work. It's like, no, no. God is everywhere. God is omnipotent. But we don't want to make him lord of the trivial. We don't want to try and shove meaning into the meaningless and thereby cheapen and trivialise God. The other trap, and this is the one I think uh, we're far more likely to fall into is not seeing God in absolutely anything. Look at what I've done. Look at the job I've got. Look at the house I live in. Look at the car I drive. For Christians living where we do in the comfort and security of the northern beaches, this is a much bigger issue. We fail to see God in anything because we've been the architect of our own prosperity. And we don't need God. We're Xerxes or we're Haman in this story the king of our domain, ruling over our empire, making the decisions as we see fit. Not seeing God at work in the detail or the apparent coincidences or the people he's placed into our lives or the opportunities he's given us or the skills he's provided us with is a big, big trap and it's something we need to continually watch for. And if we accept that there is a God and that he works through the details, he works through the ordinary, he works through the apparent coincidences then we've got a decision to make. Do we join him or, or not? Do we give our lives over to him and become part of the tapestry of details that he's using every day to bring, bring people to belief in his son Jesus or do we just walk away? We need to remember also that we don't just see God through the details. Many years ago, I worked as a junior lawyer in a law firm. And I asked one of the senior partners in the firm, I was like, what makes the best lawyers? And he gave me an answer that really stuck with me. He said, some lawyers are great at the details. They'll delve into the Tax Act and they'll tell you that section 293C subclause 1 part 2 has this great definition that relates back to the Revenue Act and the Revenue Act recently had a decision made on it by the Supreme Court of South Australia and blah, 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 and they're just neck deep in the details. They love the small stuff, the minutiae, the details. They don't necessarily see the big picture. Other lawyers are just great with the big picture. If you put company X together with company Y, the merged entity will be able to get an export licence to Japan and take advantage of these research grants and get these tax breaks, etc., etc. And not too fussed with the details. The person doing tax can work that out. He looked me in the eye and he said, the best lawyers, the best lawyers are the ones that can do both. They see the big picture, why it's all happening, and they can get in and sweat the details and understand the small stuff. In Esther, we see God in the details. The apparent coincidences, the remarkable events and decisions, the astonishing turnaround. It can only, only be God directing all of this. But it would be a mistake to think that God is only in the details. God is in total control of the big picture as well. He has a grand plan for all of humanity and he is in control of time, nature, politics, the weather, global economics, even Taylor Swift tickets. The whole lot. God can see the big picture and he can sweat the details. 
And if we can see God at work in the story of Esther, where God isn't even mentioned, then surely we can see God at work in the centrepiece of the Bible, the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. Surely we can see God at work when Jesus turns water into wine. Surely we can see God at work when Jesus walks on the water. Surely we can see God at work when Jesus heals the sick, when Jesus heal, raises Lazarus, when Jesus feeds the 5,000. And surely, surely, surely we can see God at work when his only son is crucified, dies and is buried and is raised again on the third day. In Esther we see the details, in Jesus we see the big picture. I'm sure many of us can see God at work in both Esther and through Jesus, but maybe you're someone who struggles to see God anywhere in your life. Maybe you're someone who struggles to see God at all. If so, then I encourage you to keep reading, to look again, to pray about it. God is at work here and now, and he's got a plan for your life. I'm going to wind up our time together with this quote from the famous American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson. If it comes up, please. Quick. There we go. Uh, he said this, All I have seen teaches me to trust the creator for all I have not seen. I think this is a great quote that kind of sums up what we've been working through today. If we can see God and trust God with the things we have seen, the details, the weird and wonderful events of Esther, then we can trust him with the things we haven't seen, the big plan he has for human history and the whole world for all eternity. I open this sermon by asking, where is God? And hopefully we've seen that God is working even when we can't necessarily see him. God is working in the details, in the lives of ordinary people like you and I. And God is working with what might seem like coincidences. To me, this is incredibly comforting, knowing that my life is actually part of a bigger plan, orchestrated by one more powerful than I can ever imagine. God is in control of the big picture and God is in control of the details. He can see the whole puzzle and he can see every individual piece of the puzzle as well and how each piece fits together. We ever thought, have you ever thought about what you're doing in life or why you're here? What's the point of it all? Did you ever think that you've been placed in the exact circumstances you're in because that's exactly where God wants you to be? That where you are is not just some random, accidental, happenstance event in a random, accidental world. Have you been placed in your job, your family, your church for a reason? Is there something more to your life than just a bunch of random events? If you do believe that, then you have every chance of finding God in the apparently coincidental, of finding God in the details and your every chance of finding his son, Jesus. Because maybe your life has been working towards a time such as this. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to see you in the details and in the big picture, to see your work in our lives and in the lives of those around us. May we continue to seek you and be the part you want us to be in your plan for all mankind. We ask these things in your holy and awesome name. Amen.